Have you ever felt like everyone has it more put together than you? They have that big house, that booming career, all the kids, and somehow show up every day without a messy bun and leggings. They look put together and they're making organic homemade meals. And you wonder like, how in the world are these people doing it? Everyone else has it way more put together than me. Today, Crystal Payne is joining us, best-selling author, the money-saving mom on social media, and blogger at moneysavingmom.com. As a mom of six, she has faced this lie over and over again, but she she has overcome it and is overcoming it. How? Let's find out. Here's the deal. On any given day, we think 50,000 to 80,000 thoughts. But get this, of those, let's say 50,000, 98% of them are the same ones from yesterday, which means we just keep thinking the same stuff over and over and over again, which is great if it's all true, all encouraging, lovely, praiseworthy. But with the father of the lies on the loose, out to steal your hope, kill your peace and destroy your faith? My guess is they're not. I know you because I know me. Hi, I'm Heidi Lee Anderson, Christian author, cancer survivor, and social media content creator. And in every episode of the Trade a Lie for a Truth podcast, we're camping out on one thought and picking up the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, to follow the voice of truth above all else. His name is Jesus. Because in his words, then you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. You ready? Let's seize the free abundant life in Christ one thought at a time, starting with this episode. All right, Crystal Payne is in the house. And to kick off every episode, we play Two Truths and a Lie as a way to introduce and get to know each guest. So Crystal, you're going to say three statements back to back. And I will do my very best to guess which one is the lie. Are you ready? Okay. I once had my car totaled due to carpet beetles. I can play five instruments. And my husband and I once ran for office, two different positions. I won. He didn't. What? I know you're very talented. I'm going to guess the five musical instruments. What is it? So that is accurate, except it's funny because just this morning, my my daughter was texting me and she goes, mom, what instruments can you play? So yeah. this one it was kind of a lie and kind of a truth. Okay. okay. So I took violin and piano lessons, play violin, but I can also play viola and cello and wow. a little bit of guitar, but I never took lessons. So I wouldn't say that I can play them. So yes. Good job. That is very impressive though. As someone who is not musically inclined, I can't even play one instrument. That's, that's a lot. That's a lot. My sister though, my older sister can play every single instrument. Whoa. Not kidding you. She writes orchestra so she can play every single instrument. So it's like little old me who can really only play violin and piano. So. Okay. This is actually introducing our topic, which has to do with comparison anyway. So I love it because today we're actually going to tackle the lie. Everyone else is more put together than me. Ooh. So let's set the stage. Would you mind just sharing a little bit about yourself and maybe when you first started to hear this lie? Yes. Well, I feel like that I hear this lie every single day of my life. And it's so <laughs> hilarious that we're doing this because I literally came on seven minutes late because I was running all over the house <laughs> trying to find a cord for my computer that was on 10%. And then we get on and you're like, your truth, truth's and a lie. And I realized I didn't know I was even supposed to be prepped for that. So this, we have all been there. I, am, I am coming to you all today, not as someone who is is like master this and I'm all organized and have it all figured out over here. I'm coming to you very much in the real trenches of I am still learning this every single day. But yes, my husband and I have been married for 21 years. That's a lot of years. Wonderful adventures, a lot of challenges. And um, we have six kids. They are um, almost 19 down to one, almost 19, 16, 14. And then we have two three-year-olds and a one-year-old. Um, our second three-year-old we adopted from foster care and he has a lot of disabilities abilities. And so that has been a whole journey of learning all about Down syndrome and cleft lip hmm. and palate and just a lot of things with feeding tube and surgeries. And we live in the Nashville, Tennessee area. I have written five books and have yeah. a podcast called The Crystal Pain Show. And for almost 20 years now have been online. Um, I was just thinking this morning how the online space has changed so much because when I started, there was not even social media. Podcasts weren't a thing. You know, there's so much yeah. that is just the landscape now that wasn't. We just had blogs and comments and emails. So I have a blog called moneysavingmom.com. That's kind of my main thing that I do. My husband is home full time and it's a gift that we get to run that with a wonderful team. Team of people. And you have helped me snag, I mean, mega deals. 
So when she says she runs a blog, I mean, it is like daily deals that help you just snag the best price. And by the way, my nephew just finished his fluff palette surgery and it's amazing. She sent me a picture of him last year and the difference a year can make is incredible, isn't it? It is really crazy what modern medicine can do. Like when yeah. David first came to us, he was almost eight months old and it was in the middle of the night. They had told us that he had a cleft lip. And as soon as I saw him, I'm like, oh no, that's that's a cleft yeah. palate too, you know, yeah. full cleft palate. Yeah. And I was just thinking, how are they ever going to fix this? And now yeah. people can't even tell that he yeah. had a cleft lip or palate. And it's just crazy. Ugh. He just had a surgery to get his tonsils out and his adenoid shaved. I don't even know how they figure out how to take the pieces of the right. mouth that he had and turn it into what he has now. Right? No, it's, it's an amazing thing. I know. I'm so grateful to live during this time when they can do stuff like that. All right. So to dive into this lie, everyone else is more put together than me. I mean, I love to how many kids you have and all that's going on in your world, running your own business, writing these these books. I mean, you are juggling quite a bit. So I feel like you're the perfect person to help us with this because sometimes when we look at others, we can sometimes glorify where they're at. But this lie, it feels like it's twofold, right? The first is the whole nature of this lies. We're believing something about ourselves by simply looking at others. I mean, the measuring stick isn't held up to us when we're thinking this. We're, we're holding it up to others, right? Like where they stand, how far along they are, maybe what they're doing with their lives. And by doing that, I mean, we're allowing them to define where we should be instead of letting God in our convictions do that. So I want to talk about that comparison trap and by doing that, how the metric is really ever changing because every person is so different. So let's camp out on that for a second because we let people define who we are all the time, right? And sometimes it's good. Like I'm a mom because of my kids. I'm a wife because I'm married to Ty. And again, some of these titles we own and we wear and we find our identity in they're they're obviously gifts and then indeed a part of who we are, but how do we draw that line? Like, where would you say, when does it go too far or it becomes too negative? Well, I think, you know, we can be inspired by others. I always say like, we should be inspired by others, but if yeah. we're looking at someone else as our mirror of who we're supposed to be instead of looking at God and wanting to reflect him, then I think that's where it becomes dysfunctional. Like that's when it becomes unhealthy. And so really, are we being inspired by someone or are we using them to feel like we need to be doing more and we're beating ourselves up? And ultimately, who are we looking to for our worth and our value? I think that's really at the heart of it. Yeah, no, that's so true. That is the other part. I mean, we're looking at other but then it's also how are we evaluating ourselves? And if we don't feel like we're doing enough or we're good enough or strong enough, then we're disappointed about something in us, really, about us. Can we break that down too? Because frankly, and this is actually the good news of the gospel. It's actually that we are not enough. Romans 3.23, we all fall short of the glory of God. We all sin. We all make mistakes. We don't measure up. I and mean, it's for that exact reason that Jesus came. And, and we don't love to talk about that. Because as humans, it's like, well, we still struggle with some pride because we like to have it all together. But the hard truth is we we aren't enough. But how can this truth, when we know it, actually set us free and break the stronghold of this lie that we actually aren't fully put together? No one else is. That's why Jesus came. Yeah. And I think there's just such goodness in really sitting in that I'm not enough, like owning that I'm not enough in and of myself. And it's funny that I'm saying this because years ago, so I talked about how I've been on the internet for almost 20 years. I worked with this company and we created these t-shirts. This was early on. And one of the t-shirts that we did was you are enough. And back then I was kind of feeling like I needed to self help myself into like believing these things. Like if I would tell myself you are enough, Tell yeah. myself that enough, then I'm going to somehow become enough. But God really worked in my heart to show me that that's, that's not true. Like that is a lie that I am enough in and of my own strength. But in Christ, I can do all things. And so I think, yeah. you know, the beauty of the gospel is that we don't have to be more, do more, try harder. We don't have to attain some impossible standard. We can't. But in mm -hmm. Jesus in Christ, we can do all things. And so I think to understand what it looks like to be in Christ, and I love 
just that whole word picture of like in him. I I think of the verses that talk about us being kind of covered under his wings. Like we are protected by him and we're in him. And so then no matter what someone says about us or doesn't say, no matter what we do or don't do, we are in Christ. And that is where our worth and our identity lies. And so then we can just camp there. And there's so much freedom then when we understand the truth of who we are in Christ. I love that. And I was reading the other day, Colossians 2.10. And I I love that looking up different translations sometimes to see how they word it. And I had seen in the ESV, it says you have been filled in him, but then the NLT says we are complete through our union with Christ. And like you said, on our own, I mean, we are not enough, but the beautiful thing of what scripture tells us is in Christ, we actually are complete. Like we're not lacking because he doesn't lack anything. For those in Christ, that, that's the confidence that we can have. Okay, and to go back and what you talked about, like our self-worth and our identity that shouldn't be founded in others, but God. Let's talk about the fact that we're actually all on different journeys, like at different points in time. And so maybe where I'm at right now, someone might be five steps ahead, but that's because, I mean, their journey is different than mine. Their timing that God has has over their life is is different than mine. And Hebrews 12, one through three talks about us running the race marked out for us, not not the race set before others, but the one clearly defined for us. So can you share a little bit more of that, maybe from your point of view? Because I always think of like when I was a mom with my firstborn, now as a mom of four, I mean, the things I know now are not what I knew a decade ago. And that that's okay. It just took experience on the journey that God marked out for me before I gained some wisdom and insight along the way, which I mean, I could still use some more wisdom. <laughs> I'd love to hear through you, Crystal, like how was your journey? How was God leading you and how you learn more of this truth maybe along the way? Yeah. So it's interesting with having such a wide spread with my kids of having three older ones and then three little ones. I feel like God gave me the gift that very few people get of kind of a (laughs) do-over. I feel like I always tell my oldest daughter, I'm like, I just apologize for you having to be the guinea pig and having to learn all the things. Um, But really for me, um, I wrote a book called Love Center Parenting. And in that book, I chronicle the journey that I was on of really hitting rock bottom as a parent. And it was well into my journey. And one of our kids just had a really, really difficult experience and just kind of spun out as a result of that and just spun I rolled out of control and and I start the book talking about walking into the emergency room and saying my child's suicidal. And just like as a mom, the worst thing that you can really think of is walking that sort of journey and Mm -hmm. feeling so alone. And like, you're the only one who has a child who is the problem child and the one not, you know, being invited to things and is getting asked to leave school and not be re-enrolled and and just a lot of different things like that that were really hard for me as a mom. And I feel like God used that dark time to really challenge these dysfunctional beliefs that I had believed. At first, I was just trying to help kind of fix my child, but God really wanted to heal me. And so Mm -hmm. this journey that I've been on of recognizing who I am in Christ, it has been really profound and powerful and hard. I feel like God had to take me to the place of where there was nothing else to turn to but Him. And then finding my hope and my worth and my value in him, not in my reputation in front of others, because I lost that in front of so many others. And it was so good for me. It was good for me, even though it was so hard to have people questioning, judging my parenting, criticizing me flat out, you know, saying Hmm. things behind my back to others, um, ostracizing me. Like it was, it was really challenging, but also so good because it drove me to the foot of the cross where the Hmm. only place I had was was in Jesus and to yeah. find my value in him. And so for me, I realized in that space that I was trying so hard to find my worth and value in what other people thought of me. I was looking for approval and accolades and applause from other people. Mm -hmm. And when that went away, like I was devastated and Mm -hmm. God used it to just really draw me to himself and to teach me how much he loves me. It was a real two-year journey for me of 
understanding all of these lies that I believed and the truth of who I am in Christ and walking that out and learning to live as loved and what did it mean to actually live as loved and to truly understand that God loves me for exactly who I am. And there's nothing more that I need to do or be in order to attain his love. And so then to rest in that love, it it just radically changed everything in my life, including my parenting. And so I feel like this gift of three little ones now to parent, not for my reputation, to parent, not Mm -hmm. caring if others approve or disapprove, but to just love them and just love being a mom. And there's just so much freedom in that when we just are standing in Christ and trusting in him and resting in his love for us and then letting his love flow out of us to others. Yeah. Cause it definitely has a domino effect. And it's funny. I mean, I remember a mentor of mine had said this when I first started having kids and she had said, one of the things she would highly recommend is that whenever her kid did something and she needed to discipline him, she said, I would always end each time, each talk, conversation, whatever that looked like. And she would look him in the eye and say, you know, there's nothing you can do to make me love you less. I may be disappointed, but that doesn't mean I don't love you. And I just thought that is so good because that reflects the heart of the father, right? That there's literally nothing that can separate us from his love. There are times when maybe we're disappointed in ourselves and we know we should have done better. But the good news about God is that his mercies are new every morning and Anytime we turn to him, I mean, he is filled with compassion and overflowing with forgiveness. And I think when we believe that for ourselves, it ripples down to our kids and how we react to them, right? Absolutely. And I feel like we set the tone in our homes. Like we get to show our kids what it looks like to be loved by Jesus. And we talk so much about Jesus loves me. You know, we sing this song and all of that, but are we actually living that out? Like, do our kids see us walking Hmm. that out of what it looks like to live as loved and to believe that? And if we are believing that, we're not going to be beating ourselves up. We're not going to be constantly berating ourselves and criticizing ourselves and talking about how, you know, we missed the mark and failed and all of that. We're going to be talking about the gospel and forgiveness Hmm. and then what it looks like like to walk and rest in the goodness of God and how much we're loved by him. I love that. And one of the other things I love about God is that he never asks us to do this life alone. Like not only do we have the Holy Spirit as a constant companion, a guide, a comfort, but I mean, he also gives us one another as the body of Christ to link arms with and build one another up. I was thinking of Moses who definitely didn't feel put together, right? Like he had his stutter and he was not up to what God had called him to do. He wasn't at all charismatic and he was feeling pretty small when he looked at what he was up against. But what did God do? I mean, he sent his brother at that exact time. And we read that Aaron became his mouthpiece. And in the same way, I mean, we have different gifts as the body. Not every single one of us is like an arm or a leg or a funny bone. Like we are all gifted in some way, but ultimately to be used together, never alone for Jesus. So I would love to hear like about your gifts, Crystal. How has the Lord wired you? Hmm. You know, it's interesting because for years, like I talked about how my sister can play all these instruments and and I am second of seven kids and my older sister and the brother that's right underneath me are just both very, very gifted and talented. The brother that's right underneath me, he's an aeronautical engineer and he is a test pilot and goes and does all these really amazing, cool things. And my older sister writes orchestras and she won all these awards and all these things. And for years, it's like, there's me. Like I felt like I don't have any special gifts or talents. I was just a real kind of run of the mill sort of child growing up. I struggled in school. I struggled to make friends. I just struggled with a lot of insecurity and just had a lot of that second born syndrome and really struggled to kind of find like, what's my place? Like, what's my thing? And it really took a lot of years of God working in my heart of me finding my security in him instead of seeking approval from others to just own my gifts and be like, okay, so I might not have 25 gifts, but I have a few. They're really great gifts. And so I'm going to own those. And so for me, one of my gifts is that I can take big picture ideas and break them down into bite-sized pieces. And that's really what I do online with my books. I, for the longest time, wanted to to write words that would just make people go, oh, instead I'm like 10 steps to cut your grocery bill, you know, and just to rec- 
that's how God's gifted me. Like that yes. is the way that he's gifted me. And we need, we need the poetic, but we also need the practical. And 100%. there's a gifting in being someone who is very practical. And so I can look at a business and I can see the different areas that, you know, if you would tweak this and this and this, you would probably be a lot more profitable. And so that's something that God has gifted me. And also just a brain that can kind of see the whole big picture. And so I don't have to have a lot of things written down a lot of the time because I can just see all the moving parts of something. And for the longest time, I just assumed everybody could do that. And to recognize, yeah. no, like that is a right. gift thing that God's given me and to be able to figure out how to monetize things. And also the gift of asking good questions and being a good listener. And so it's fun yeah. to be able to do that. Now with the podcast, I love to be able to interview <laughs> guests and just hear their stories. But then also just in my community, my kids always say that I have a thing where I find out the deep stories of people that no one else knows. And it'll be within a few <laughs> minutes. Like we had somebody over just the other day, somebody I'd never met. And within three minutes, she was telling me the story of how her daughter had passed away when she was oh. 20. And I ask a few other people, they're like, nobody knew that. And I don't know what question I asked, but it just, we felt comfortable sharing that with me. And that just happens so often. And so to see that as a gift of God's giving me the gift of being able to ask good questions and be a good listener and just really care deeply about people and their souls and their stories. And I love that you're so humble when you're like, you know, my brother's this and my sister's that. And it's like, well, you're a best selling author of multiple books. You've been on Dave Ramsey. You've done all this stuff. I mean, Crystal, you are very talented, but I do love that you called out people people that have those practical gifts, because we may not always see that the organized, the practical, we often will put these people who are very creative up on a pedestal. And they, I mean, it's a beautiful gift for sure. But I love that you call that out that if you have these practical administrative gifts too, I mean, those are indeed gifts to be used along with the body. Okay. And I think when we are caught up in the comparison trap too, and thinking we aren't as put together as someone else, it's because we're looking at them too, in their heyday, like in their own giftings, their strengths, and sure, it may not be our strength, but again, we also have our own. And on top of that, God is so good that he doesn't just shine through our strengths like we've talked about. But 2 Corinthians 12, 9 says he's actually most strong in our weakness. When we are weak, then he is strong. And again, that's something we don't always love to talk about. For me personally, I feel like this a lot with my health, my body after having cancer. I mean, my weakness and the battle that I face day in and day out, it has a lot to do with the health concerns of today. And it's funny, my husband was saying, man, you can reassure others with the truth all day long. But then when you have a weird symptom, it is so hard for you to recognize that truth applies for yourself too. And, and I feel that sometimes I can go down worst case scenarios, but it's also in these moments when I've relied on God, I've really seen my good shepherd leading me through. And, and it's actually, I mean, I will say I have never felt more comfort from the Lord than through those situations when I felt felt so weak. I mean, he really is closer than a brother. So would you be willing to share maybe a weakness of yours where you've seen God prove himself strong on your behalf through it? Yes. Uh, I could, I could pick so many different ones. And you know, one of the things that I have really challenged myself with is when I show up online is showing up as I am. And I know that that's not what everybody's called to, but every single morning, pretty much I show up without makeup and my hair fixed. And it, it is <laughs> me standing there saying my security and worth is in the Lord and not in me putting on a mask of makeup or whatever. You know, I love yeah. makeup, but for me, it's, it's been an important practice of showing up as I am. And I really struggled for years. I talked about insecurity and I think it leads back to in my childhood of just growing up kind of in the shadow of my older sister. And it wasn't anything that my parents did. It was really things that I internalized that were unhealthy beliefs about myself. But, you know, this lie of everyone having it more put together than me, it started from a young age of just seeing like my sister being able to like run circles around me. And, you know, it's like she could sew, she could cook, she could do music, basically anything that she set her mind to do, she could do. And I tried all of those things and I just paled in comparison. So I really struggle with insecurity of like, I'm just 
I'm not good at these things. And I, I believe so many lies about myself. And then it led to even when I started writing online and started getting opportunities to do different media and things like that, I said no. I said no to speaking in media because I was so afraid of making a fool of myself and so scared of going up in front of people, whether it was on live video, on live TV, or whether it was on a live stage. So I said no for a few years to all the opportunities until God just really started challenging me that I was living in fear and I was letting fear be my guide. So I started saying yes, even though it scared me so much. I remember the first thing was I was going to give a speech. I was asked to give a speech at a conference and I wrote out every single word of every single thing that I was going to say. It was the worst <laughs> speech in the history of mankind, pretty much. I should say read, not speech, because uh, that's what it was. I was shaking I was sick to my stomach for six weeks before I went in the bathroom before and I was like, I cannot do this. But oh. it was me standing on that stage saying, I'm not going to let fear be what yeah. controls me. I'm not going to let my fear of what other people think of me be controlling me. And so to stand up there and do a, a terrible job, but to stand up there and finish. And so it was a few years of me standing on stages and doing a terrible job, but still standing up there. And I think for me in my weakness, for God's strength to be glorified and continuing to say yes, continuing to show up when I knew that I wasn't good at this, but I wanted to get better. And the only way to get better was to push through and to keep learning and to keep practicing. And it's just so interesting to me today that yeah. what I do now is so much communication through live video and things that would have just <laughs> petrified me before. And now I love them. Like I really enjoy standing on a stage. I really enjoy doing live media. I really enjoy doing yeah. live video. I really enjoy podcasting, being on interviews. It's something that I love and something that I've actually become <laughs> good at with a lot of practice and also learning to find my worth and my security in Jesus. And you're going to have some times when you're going to bomb things still. I still do for sure. But to continue to go back to the truth of I'm not going to let fear be what drives me. And so for me, it's me showing up every single day and not allowing the voices of insecurity to be my guide, but instead to look to the voice of truth and remind myself of the truth of God's word. For me, it's been such a journey of, of healing and to stand on the stage in confidence in Christ, mm -hmm. not in who I am, not in what I have to bring to the table, but who Jesus is and what he's done in my life. That is a great encouragement. And it is just so funny because I don't know if you guys know this, but me and Chris so we met last year at a conference, the Wellness Collective. We were both speakers. And I mean, she rocked it. So imagining you being up there and you saying it was the worst, it is just so hard for me to imagine because that is like your wheelhouse now. But I love that you said that where it took practice. It took telling yourself the truth. It took showing up when maybe you didn't feel like it and God showed himself strong. All right. So because you're a practical person, you can help us with this because I think sometimes it's easier for us to talk about these truths truths like in theory and we can know them in our minds like yeah this is right this is what I should do but then practically we struggle with how like how does this actually look like how can I live this truth out and I know you've been there you've not only faced and felt this lie but you've overcome it and you are daily overcoming it through the word of God and the power of the Holy Spirit can you tell us how? Like when you've thought this lie, what did you do about it to turn things around and maybe not give into that internal disappointment? So one of the biggest things is not only recognizing the lie, because I think that's the first step. Like we have to recognize these lies that we're believing. And I really challenge people to pay attention to what you're paying attention to. What is going through your mind? Like, what is that internal monologue in your head? What are you speaking about yourself to those closest to you? What words are you saying? Are you saying words that aren't words that are the truth of God's word and the truth of what God says about you? So pay attention and start recognizing those lies. But then it's not enough to just recognize it, to replace it with the truth. For me, it was a two-year process when I started to recognize that I was believing all of these lies and these lies were the labels that I led with and lived under and then to start replacing those with truth. And so I would actually call it out. I would say it out loud. Like when I would hear in my head, everybody else is more put together than you to say that's 
a lie and mm-hmm. then to replace it with the truth. So it might be a verse. It might be something else, just the truth of what God says about me, but I would have specific things for me for the lies. So now, like for instance, this morning when I'm scrambling around trying to find the computer cord <laughs> seven minutes late to come on here and do this, instead of being like, you're just failing, you have to be like, okay, I can learn from this. What can I do better next time? I shouldn't have assumed mm-hmm. that I had a computer cord, but the truth is, God loves me exactly as I am for who I am. And he sees my heart and he knows my heart and I can rest in his love. And so to speak the truth, to preach the truth to myself. And sometimes you might be in a place where you feel like I, I don't, I'm not even there. Like I, I can recognize the lies, but I just don't feel like, or it even feels like a truth to me, right. but yeah. to call it out verbally as a lie and then to have some other people in your life to speak the truth to you. So to be able to text your friends and say, you know, I'm believing this today and have her speak the truth over you. For me, my husband, a lot of times I'll just say, can you just pray for me? I am believing lies. This is what I'm Mm -hmm. believing and praying for me. There is power in prayer. There is power in someone praying over you, praying the truth, speaking the truth over you. I also would say having truth around you. So making sure that you're filling your mind up with truth. So spending time in God's word. If you're like, I have so much going on. I don't have time. Well, you do have time. If it's important Mm -hmm. to you, you're going to make time. Thank you but also you can find creative ways. So while you're doing your makeup or taking a shower, you can have God's word playing while you're fixing your child's hair or fixing lunches or driving in the car, like having God's word and God's truth. I just feel like to be so permeated and filled up with the truth so that there's not room for lies to take up residence. Because if we allow the truth to be what is just filled up in us, then yeah. as those lies come, they're just kind of kind of bounce off of us. It's kind of like the duck and the water coming off the duck because we are so filled up with God's truth. And so that's really mm-hmm. what I seek to be, you know, proactively filling myself up with the truth and then reactively as I recognize the lies to call it out as a lie and then to replace it with the truth. I have like a wall hanging banner that has that Philippians verse, whatever is true, think on these things. And, and that has helped me so often when I'm sitting on the couch and I'm worrying about these what if worst case situations. And I just have to look at that one line and it says, think on whatever is true. And I have to ask myself, is this true? Like, do I know this as fact? Or have I just imagined it in my mind as what could be? Well, God tells me I actually don't need to think on that. He tells me I can think on what is true. And so like you said, that is a great encouragement to just surround ourselves physically. I mean, put it on the wall, slap it on your bathroom mirror, wherever you see it so that you keep reminding yourself of the truth because lies come at us all day long, right? All right. Well, Crystal, to wrap up every episode, we end with five rapid fire questions and they are just for fun. So no need to overthink it. Just give us like your no filter knee jerk reaction. You ready? Number one, which volunteer position at church are you glad someone else has? Oh, I would not like to be the greeter because that's my insecurities that I'm still working through. So yes, I think in youth ministry or children's ministry, which I know a lot of people are not into, but I I love that. Okay. I always think of that meme where it's like the camouflage hunter and the song, leave me alone. Some of us are like, I'm not, I'm not there. I'm not ready. I would also not like to be a worship leader. Just saying yes. So, okay. Okay. Well then that leads to my next question. Would you rather sing the offering communion song or serve? back-to-back services in the toddler room oh back-to-back services in the toddler room (laughs) either some people either love it and like you're gifted both musically and with kids whereas some people it's like a nightmare both of them so the next one out of all the characters in the bible who do you feel like would be your best friend Oh, that's a good question. I mean, one of my favorite characters is Joseph. I don't know if we'd be good friends, but I really, really love his story. I love how he trusted in God and chose to continue on in the worst circumstances, like down in the pit and down when he's in the prison, he's raised up to be the head of the prison. And I just think, I hope that I would be that kind of person too, that if I'm put in that worst case scenario, that instead of just moaning and moping around, I'm going to choose to say, let's make the most of this. Yeah. And I love that he waited to see the goodness of God. It kind of took some decades, but he was able to look back and say, I saw how God intended for good. Okay. I love that. The fourth question, what throwback worship song from the eighties or nineties would you want your worship leader to bring back? Mm. Okay. So this is going to get into my um, history. We did (laughs) not 
I was raised in a super legalistic culture, homeschooled and everything. Oh. We didn't have contemporary Christian music. So I don't even know what songs exactly are 80s. I think Sandy Patty, Steve Green. I don't know. We had to throw out our Sandy Patty records. So um, wow. So I, we only sang hymns in classical music. So yeah, like, I mean, I, I don't have any hit. Like, I don't have any song from my childhood that I was like, let's bring that okay. back. But, I mean, I love the hymns and I always love them when right. I was in the church. But okay, that is interesting. But, See, these questions right bring out things and people are it's like, that's right. I didn't know that about you. Okay, the last question. What percentage are you late to church? Oh, yes. Um, it is always a victory when we get there on time. We were actually on time two weeks ago, which was really exciting, but that's only because our church recently went from two services to three services. <laughs> So they moved the time from 10.45 to 11.10. So we're trying to pretend like it's still 10.45. Totally. And I think we have gotten there on time or like a few minutes early since then three times. So that is like a huge deal. But that is still very impressive. I, that is very impressive. I mean, 11.10, you'd think we could all get out the door. But what is it about Sunday morning? It like, is. It what is. is it? We get out the door way earlier on other mornings. But it's 100%. honestly, it's usually my teenagers. It's usually them that they're... They're the ones, you know, dragging down the stairs. And I'm like, sure. seriously, guys, you get up for school every yes. morning, but Sunday morning, three hours later than usual, you can't see your day. It's the weekend. It's the weekend. Oh man. Well, thank you so much, Crystal, for having this conversation with me today. I hope by the time that you guys are done listening to this, we can trade the lie that everyone else is more put together than me and trade that for the truth that none of us are put together, but in Christ, we are complete. So thank you so much, Crystal, for helping us declare this truth in our our own lives. You're always such a blessing and encouragement. And for those, by the way, who are not following you yet on the gram, I mean, you need to right now, but please share more about where people can find you, what you're doing and how we can keep being encouraged by you and your family. So my favorite place to hang out is Instagram. Um, I'm the money saving mom on there only because I had money saving mom earlier. And then people <laughs> told me you should switch to your name. And then I changed my mind and switched back and somebody else had taken money saving mom. So I'm the money saving mom on there. Don't do what I did. Um, I and did not know that. So, but I love sharing behind the scenes on stories, just real life, and also just encouragement and money saving ideas and stuff as well. And then my blog is moneysavingmom.com. So, if you're looking for ways to save money, great deals, that's the place to go. And my podcast is called The Crystal Pain Show. Well, thanks again, Crystal, for joining us. We love you so much. Today, let's move forward and that we are complete in Christ. Mm -hmm.